All right, our scripture lesson today is one verse. Psalm 33, 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. Now today, it's probably more of a history lesson than a sermon. I'm going to talk about the 4th of July a little bit. And, you know, whenever I say something like that, people get all upset. Well, you know, church and politics don't go together. Well, I'm not going to talk about politics. Um, But I am going to talk about our roots as a nation, a Christian nation. Now, the 4th of July, uh, we Americans take it pretty seriously. Uh, We Americans spent $6.9 billion on food. We consumed 150 million hot dogs. I had two of those. We ate 700 million pounds of chicken. We spent $825 million on fireworks. We imported 5.4 million American flags, most of them made in China, okay? Okay. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And people try to minimize the spiritual angle of the American Revolution, but do you realize that if you're enjoying your freedom, you need to thank a Presbyterian? Yes, this is the truth. As we celebrate freedom from British governance, uh, Presbyterians were the ones who influenced the decision to enter into war for our independence. Uh, I'll give you a few examples. It was the Presbyterian understanding of Romans 13 that says we're to be subject to the authorities that gave the permission for the nation to go to war. You see, for the Presbyterians, they saw a nuance that allowed for there to be rebellion against tyranny in other places of the Bible. It was a Presbyterian pastor, John Witherspoon, who preached such a stirring message to the colonists that they decided they needed to go for their independence. King George referred to the War of Independence as a Presbyterian uprising. England's Prime Minister, Horace Walpole, said into the Parliament, Cousin America has run off with the Presbyterian parson. Lorraine Botner, who wrote Calvinism in America, said the revolution of 1776, so far as it was affected by religion, was a Presbyterian measure. So intense and universal and aggressive were the Presbyterians in their zeal for liberty. Historians note that when Cornwallis was driven back to ultimate defeat and surrender in Yorktown, all of the colonels of the colonial army except for one were Presbyterian elders. It's just the kind of folks that I got to deal with, okay? (laughs) More than half of the soldiers and officers of the American army during the revolution were Presbyterians. A German mercenary soldier wrote, call this war by whatever name you may. It's nothing more or less than a Scots-Irish Presbyterian rebellion. The British troops, they understood the Presbyterians' role in the war, and so they turned all the church buildings into stables or burned them to the ground. Joseph Galloway, a former Speaker of the House, fled back to England, blaming the Presbyterians for the war, calling it a religious quarrel. And finally, Harvard historian Dr. G. Bancroft notes that the first public voice in America for dissolving all connection with Great Britain came not from the Puritans of New England, nor the Dutch of New York, not the planters of Virginia, but the Scotch-Irish Presbyterians of the Carolinas. God used the Presbyterians to bring liberty to the new world. So, Presbyterians, not so bad, huh? And as you and I sing God Bless America, I want you to realize that when you invoke the name of God into your situation, something happens, personally and as a nation. Remember when the children of Israel were on their exodus out of Egypt, and the Pharaoh had to change of mind. Why did we let all these slaves go? And so they came with the greatest army known to humanity at that time to retrieve their slaves. 
They find the Israelites up against the Red Sea, so they can't go forward or they're going to drown. If they turn around and fight, they're going to get slaughtered. The best they could hope for was re-enslavement. It was a similar situation during July 1776. You see, the colonial population is outnumbered three to one by England. The army of the the colonists never had more than 17,000 soldiers. The British had 50,000 trained, uh, hardened soldiers. Uh, The American Navy had eight little ships. The British Navy was the largest the world had ever seen before. The British are the world's greatest superpower. America has no chance. So what happened with the Israelites? Moses called out to the Lord, and the Lord said, Part the waters, bring the Israelites across, I'll make the the land dry, and then I'll clean up after the Egyptians. That's what happened. What did the Americans do? Something similar. Uh, When facing the world's greatest superpower in 1776, the Second Congressional Congress proclaimed the National Day of Humiliation, Fasting, and Prayer. That we may with united hearts confess and bewail our manifold sins and transgressions, and by a sincere repentance and amendment of life, appease his righteous displeasure through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ and obtain pardon and forgiveness. What did they do? They went to prayer and they humbled themselves before the Lord. Uh, Why would they know to do this? Well, it's actually the pattern that was established when America was first even thought of back in um, 1620. Remember the Mayflower? They had a compact. It's called the First American Constitution. In fact, John Quincy Adams called it the foundation for the United States Constitutions. It states, the pilgrims undertook their voyage for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. And when Governor William Bradford came ashore, they all fell upon their knees. They blessed the God of heaven who brought them through the vast and furious ocean. And then came the fundamental orders of 1639, the first written constitution in the new world. Its preamble states, to maintain and preserve the liberty and purity of the gospel of our Lord Jesus, which we now profess. So that's 1639. Fast forward 150 years. What happens? The commander-in-chief sought to lead his army to victory over the British forces. And this is what he told the troops. The time is now at hand, which must probably determine whether Americans are to be freemen or slaves, whether they're to have any property that they can call their own. The fate of unborn millions will now depend upon God and on the courage and conduct of this army. Let us therefore rely on the goodness of the cause and the aid of our supreme being in whose hands victory is to animate and encourage us to great and noble actions. That's the way our country got started. That kind of close dependence upon the Lord. Now, I want to be clear here. God does not love America more than he loves other people. The Lord's relationship is for all of humanity. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God will bless every nation whose people make him the Lord. And when you personally or us as a nation step into a covenant relationship with God, he releases all the benefits of a relationship with him, his protection, his guidance, his hand that moves and blesses and cares for you. And so I want to explore the dynamics of being in this relationship with God a moment, especially as we think about freedom. Now, we all know the difference between dogs and cats, right? Dogs look at their owners and think, you love me, you feed me, you meet all my needs, you must be God, okay? (laughs) Cats, they look at their owners and think, you love me, you feed me, you take care of all my needs, I must be God, Did you know that there are now in America more cat families than there are dog families? It's true. 
It's hard to argue, though, that, you know, that well-known aphorism uh, that canine companions are humanity's best acquaintances? That's the politically correct way of saying dogs are man's best friends, okay? British theologian C.S. Lewis, he adored dogs, and he once made the observation about the boundaries we place on the lives of our pets. Dogs are not allowed to put their paws on the dining room table. They're forbidden to chase the neighbor's cat, search for morsels in the garbage can, or launch a frontal assault at the letter carrier. They're not permitted to use the dining room as an emergency latrine. They're not to offer their fur as a resort for ticks and fleas. On a soggy day, a dog will be scolded for shaking water and mud on everything in sight. But those are things that dogs do naturally. Doesn't it seem cruel and unusual to invite an animal into our house and then impose standards and rules that conflict with its very nature? You see, if dogs have the capacity, could you imagine if they could imagine a life they'd love to, to live? Wouldn't it be just running freely without any fences, never having to be accountable or come when they're called, <clears throat> do whatever they want, whenever they want, wherever they want? You know, we think of freedom in, in those terms. They wouldn't have to go to vets and wear the cone of shame anymore either, okay? And maybe we should start a canine liberation movement. Not so fast, says Lewis. It's true, a dog who is on his own is free. He's free to experience the unpredictability of a daily existence when there's no guarantee of food, shelter, health, or companionship. Such freedom is exceedingly risky and expensive. An untrained mutt who's been welcomed into the caring family, it does indeed forfeit some of its liberty, but the trade-offs are impressive. A dog who lives within the rules of the house gets to take naps by the fireplace, go for rides in the car, receive occasional scraps from the table, and best of all, sleep in your beds as trusted friends. I mean, life doesn't get any better than that. Little Boaz, he curls up underneath the arch of my foot every night, okay? And, you know, we, turn, we think of freedom in terms of whatever we want to do. That's the cornerstone of a happy life. But freedom without boundaries, it's actually highly overrated. Uh, make no mistake about it, when you surrender your heart to Jesus Christ, you're going to be subjected to a, a new set of boundaries on your life that from one perspective looks restrictive and actually gets ridiculed by the non-believer. I mean, why should you give up your freedom to plot revenge against the person who wounded you? Or, or uh, cut corners on your expense reports, or follow your sexual impulses wherever they lead. Well, why should you not be free to do whatever you want to do? And the answer is the things people naturally do have never had the capacity to bring about the joy that they advertise. You see, when you become a member of God's family, it opens up a world of privileges and opportunities that most of us would never have allowed ourselves to imagine. The fact that you can fix your broken relationships, that you can have peace within yourself, that you can see the hand of God move within your life, that you have a joy that's not dependent upon your circumstances, a peace that, that's there regardless of what's going on. So many of the benefits that, that are yours. You know, we think in terms of freedom being uh, the right to do whatever we want, but the freedom that Jesus brings is this. You now have freedom not to do what the natural sinful self would normally do. Normally you would hold a grudge and indulge yourself and, and, and you know, not care about other people. But then he comes along and lifts you to a higher form of freedom that brings so many more benefits into your life. You know, we give up the freedom to do <clears throat> just anything in order to experience the freedom of what we've always wanted in our hearts. See, God knows what we want and what we need. You know, we may not get to live a dog's life, but that doesn't mean, spiritually speaking, that we have to end up in the dog's house, okay? You know, last month, speaking of freedom, it was June, let me see, Juneteenth. You ever heard of this? 
It's the Emancipation Day in Texas. It happened in June 18, 1865. Union soldiers under the command of, of General Gordon Granger, they landed in Galveston, Texas. And he brought news of something that happened more than two months earlier. The Confederate General Robert E. Lee surrendered his troops and the Civil War was officially over. Now, the next day, General Gordon read aloud a statement called General Order Number 3. The people of Texas are informed in accordance with the proclamation from the executive of the United States that all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves. You have to realize when this statement was made, there were a quarter million slaves in Texas. And until that moment, the citizens of Galveston had no idea that the declaration had been made, no clue even that the president had been executed earlier in the spring. And I tell you this because it brings an important truth forth. What good is good news if we haven't heard it? The Emancipation Proclamation actually occurred in January 1, 1863. Two and a half years later, these people didn't know anything about it. And I wonder how many people are going through life unaware that Jesus has removed the power of sin over their lives. And they continue to live their daily existence under that domination of, of, of sin and, and Satan's rule. And, and there's news available to them. There's an agenda that's free. God's love that's been extended to them. And, and friends, God's amazing grace, I want you to understand just how amazing it is. There's nothing we can do to make him love us more. And there's nothing we can do to make him love us less. It's important that you hear this because how many times we... You know, get into that bad frame of mind, bad behavior, bad season in life, and we're, oh boy, you know, I'm going to be cast into the fires of hell. Actually, no, you're not. All payment of sin was taken care of on the cross. And, and when you're having a bad season, the Lord's going, hey, come back and do life with me. Your sins have been forgiven. But why do you subject yourself to all this sinfulness it's just going to destroy the inside of you and everybody around you. See, when you give your life to Jesus Christ, he grabs a hold of you with a grip that will never let you go. And we're called to repent, and this is what repent looks like. It means you used to live life in, when you, you're in charge, but when you repent, you change the direction, and now God's in charge of your life. He's the one calling the shots in your world. You now follow his dictates, and he has basically one dictate, love one another as I have loved you. And I want you to understand how much he loves you. While we were yet sinners, he died for you. Amen. When you struggle, he's committed to you. He's placed his very spirit within you so that you're never apart from his guidance, his activation, his love for you. He's got heaven waiting for you and heaven starts now when you start speaking and enjoying and pursuing that relationship. And you might be going, well, I'm unworthy. We were all unworthy. And even Moses, meeting with the Lord face to face in the tent at the end of his life, makes a mistake, okay? It doesn't, it's not based on sin management or behavior modification. It's all based on how much God loves you. Ephesians 2.8, okay, you have been saved by grace, through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift from God. And here's the deal. Notice when the soldiers arrived in Texas with this good news, that, that freedom just isn't something that happens by force of arms. You know, we can come along and say, hey, you got to behave this way. And you might behave that way out of fear of punishment, but nothing's happened on the inside of your heart, okay? Real change occurs from the inside out. You know, the Union soldiers, they came with the Emancipation Proclamation. But, you know, this news, I mean, yeah, it started in motion, something very important, that everyone is equal, and, 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 and everyone 
has a right before the Lord to, to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But here's the deal. Not everybody feels that way. You know, we went from the Civil War and we made some progress all the way up to uh, the Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s. But have you noticed there's a bunch of racism and prejudice and problems going on in our world today right now? And i got to be honest, I'm a little confused. I'm like, well, where did all that come from? I, I thought we had grown past it. And see, you can't grow past it unless the Lord grows within you. It's when he gets a hold of your heart that things start to change. Yesterday, I'm driving down the road with my son, and the people in front of me, they throw their trash out on the window. And I start to get an attitude. And then the Lord convicts me. No attitude, okay? These are people that I love. And maybe they don't have your standards of cleanliness. Maybe they haven't, don't have access to the way you do life, but you know what? I love them and I care for them and I want you not to curse but to bless people. And that means when you and I have access to God in our hearts, he's gonna change the way we see everybody. We start to love everybody. And right now, friends, I want you to hear me. You know, 154 years ago, you know, that, that gentleman made the proclamation, hey, everybody's equal. But, but you and I, we have an agenda from God to make sure that people know this. And how do we do that? By carrying out the one commandment, love one another as I have loved you. That's the way it happens. The idea that some people matter less is the root cause of all that's wrong in the world. And it's when you and I understand that Everybody is a child of God, and he loves everybody, and he wants us to bring his love to everybody. Suddenly, it changes our perspective, and it changes our lifestyle. Well, I want to talk about this gift of grace a little bit more. <clears throat> Sometimes it seems like it's too good to be true. I mean, <clears throat> if you were to take a look at all the sins in your life and, and compare it to the gift that's been offered, I think most of us would go, I'm not worthy of that gift. And you're right, you're not. But guess what? It's not based on your worth, it's based on God's love for you. And this gift that's too good to be true, it's true. I'm gonna give an example of a gift that was too good to be true. A, a British chemist, James Smithson, he died and he left his entire inheritance to America. This is back in 1835. It was about $12 million worth of inheritance that he gave to the nation of America. And it had one accompanying guiding sentence. It should be used to increase the diffusion of knowledge among men. That we're to increase, increase the knowledge of, of, of humanity. Well, the government authorities were immediately suspicious. I mean, you know, the War of 1812 was 20 years earlier when the British, you know, devastated Washington, D.C., and, and we had, the, you know, that, that incredible war. Um, Smithson's half-brother led the charge in the Revolutionary War against the Americans, okay? They were thinking, this is a Trojan horse. We don't want this gift. In fact, President Andrew Jackson recommended declining the gift. The senator from South Carolina said, it's beneath the dignity of the United States to receive presents of this kind. But John Quincy Adams, he always believed in governmental support of the arts and sciences. And he said the country had the imperious and indispensable obligation to take the money and put it into use. So what do you do with a gift that's too good to be true? You say thank you. And then you put it into action so that it might be a gift to others. Back in 1846, James Smithson's gift was put into use and it became the Smithsonian Institute. The nation's attic now includes 19 museums that hold 104, 154 million items, nine research centers, and a zoo. Annually, 30 million people walk through the Smithsonian for free. First, the gift had to be received, and then it was turned into a gift for others. So, so what do we do with the gift that God offers that seems to be too good to be true? We say thank you. It's not based on you. It's based on him. That's what a gift's all about. It's not an exchange. It's a gift. And there is no gift like grace. 
It's his lavish, unconditional, absolutely undeserved attitude of love and kindness towards you. It can't be earned. It can't be deserved. It can't be reasoned away because God relentlessly offers it to you. All you can do with the gift of grace is receive it. And then with God's help, we do everything we can to transform that gift into a blessing for others. You know, I think it's amazing. Americans... um, we pray that God sheds his grace on us. And truly, our nation is the wealthiest nation in history. Uh, we have resources and blessings that nobody else has ever experienced anywhere. And, and there comes an obligation with this gift. We receive it, and then we prepare it for the next generation. We look for ways that we might take our blessings and, and, and bestow them upon others. I'm thinking of American Christians who, in the mission field, single-handedly created the church of Jesus Christ in the most powerful ways. I can't say single-handedly, but in most powerful ways in Asia, in South America, in Africa, in so many other different places. We change the landscape of Christianity by using our Christianity to get it out to everybody else. You might say <clears throat> it was the original American mandate by the pilgrims. Let's get Jesus out to everybody. Guess what? That's what happened. And I think this is where it gets personal for you and me. Is that what's happening in your life? I mean, we get all these incredible blessings, but are there avenues through your life to other people? Are you filling up the offering plate? Are you filling up your prayer list? Are you finding people to care for and forgive and be kind to? Are you allowing the Lord to change your attitude so that you're a beacon of his life? Are you somebody that's been blessed and now live to be a blessing? And that blessing has one purpose, that people might see our amazing God. You know, three years after Samuel Adams organized the Boston Tea Party, he signed the Declaration of Independence, and he made this personal declaration. We have this day restored the sovereign to whom all men ought to be obedient. He reigns in heaven, and from the rising to the setting of the sun, let his kingdom come. That's how our nation started. And Christians, that's the agenda that you and I have in this crazy, increasingly secular world. And this leads us to the communion table. We would have never been able to, excuse me, that leads us to the offering plate. Good save. All right. Last week, uh, and I love this this week, as we talk about freedom, all of the freedom that we have is built upon foundations that have been laid for us. And in the scripture, the foundations we talked about last week were the foundation of evangelism or reaching the lost, teaching and integrity to the scriptures, um, the presence, abiding in the presence of the Lord, and, and caring for the needs of the community. All of those things are made possible by this thing called generosity. Generosity is the very thing that kills cynicism, skepticism, and selfishness in our lives. Now, I know that none of you ever struggle with any of those things at all. So let me just talk about me. Whenever I'm feeling the slightest bit bit selfish or cynical or skeptical or, or, or any of that shows up in my heart, I find moving in the opposite spirit combats those things. Generosity is that that intentional, purposeful action of the heart that says to God, I trust you. And what it does is it points a mocking finger in the face of selfishness in your own heart, saying, you won't master me. And I would say this, that making generosity a part of your worship time each week will reinforce everything that pours out of this this pulpit, everything that pours out in these sermons and these messages. It's almost like this is a time where I go, I I, I want everything that was talked about and spoken about today to be reinforced in my life. And so this is the way that I sew back into that. 
I want to encourage you to introduce just a, a, a generosity as a part of your worship experience every single week. And some of you uh, may find it to be the most powerful and inspirational part of this entire time that we're together each week because it does something inside. It does something to your heart. My prayer is that you would find that it is more blessed to give than to receive. And uh, the only way you can even experience that is in exhibiting generosity. There's a number of ways that you can give here today. And then the offering envelopes that are in front of you is always an effective way. But if you look at the screen behind me, there's a number up there, 407-680-1872. You can text the amount you want to give to that number. And uh, that's one of the easiest ways to do it. Let me read a scripture for you today. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 24 says, There are those who scatter and yet increase all the more. In other words, you give and you find that you're in a place of receiving. And then there are those who withhold what is justly due, and it results in only want. In other words, you try to hoard, and then you never have enough. The promise of the scriptures goes like this. The generous man will be prosperous. The generous man will be prosperous. We've been blessed to be a blessing and to live our lives advancing the kingdom of God all over the earth so that the gospel reach farther than we have time to go. Pray with me today. Father, I thank you for this time of worship. Lord, that everything that we've learned and heard of today, the history that's been passed down to us today would be reinforced by us sending dollars forth as soldiers into the kingdom of God to accomplish your purposes all over the earth. And Lord, today I pray that you would bless each and every person in this room. God, would you prosper them so that they might have everything necessary to be the blessing that they know they want to be. God, today in our giving, we say we trust you and we love you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.